Walter de B is Director of Engineering at Datadog for Data and Analytics. The title of his talk is Data Infrastructure in a Multi-Cloud Environment. Please put your hands together for our first speaker, Walter de B. Good morning. Uh, it's really, really good to be here. Um, I was here, I just looked it up just while I was waiting here. I was here in 2016, um, and then obviously COVID happened for a while, and it's just really, really good to be back here in, in Budapest, one of my favorite cities in, probably in the world. Um, nevertheless, I'm going to talk a little bit about data infrastructure in a multi-cloud environment. Um, let's talk a little bit about me. Uh, I'm not that interesting, so I'm, I'm going to keep this very short. Um, but I'm from this country, the Netherlands. This is not the Luxembourg flag, uh, but the Dutch one. Um, I live in New Orleans, Louisiana, so through uh, some uh, nice travels, Netherlands, Sweden, New York, I ended up in, in New Orleans. This is what we do, we parade in New Orleans for everything. Um, it's a really great city. If you've never been, more than welcome. Let me know when you, when you come and I'll show you around. Um, Quick, this is sort of my background, uh, spent quite a bit of time at Spotify. Last time I sp st stood here on stage, it was a different location, but still. Um, I was at Spotify, then I was at the New York Times for about a year, and currently I'm at Datadog, and I do this. Um, this is the best picture I could find that would say something about data and analytics. Um, so if you uh, type in data analytics at Google, this is one of the coolest. So this is the job, right? It's graphs. and like cool icons. Um, but I head up um, teams that work on one hand building a data infrastructure platform for data engineers throughout the company. And secondly, uh, we do internal analytics and that's a team that um, helps people enab or enables people to, to do analytics uh, like for running the business. So we don't really do analytics ourselves, we enable others to do that. So we're not the, the part of the company where you can come to and say like, I need a spreadsheet or I need a, a graph for, for my presentation tomorrow. Now we'll give you the tools and the data and the knowledge to, uh, to do so. Um, um, so I do that, this is Datadog. I don't know how many of you know Datadog. We've grown quite a lot in, uh, in the last few years, but what we, what we predominantly do is monitoring and observability. So um, where we're particularly good at is um, like cloud, cloud technology. So if you have like cloud infrastructure, we can monitor that for you um, from um, servers, uh, VMs, containers, but also like cloud specific products like um, queues, SQS, PubSub, uh, to databases, managed or not, RDS, MySQL, um, et cetera. Um, and it kind of looks like this. So you send us your data, it's metrics, logs, um, traces as we call them um, for so your applications and then you can dashboard them, you can create monitors, you can analyze things, uh, etc. Lots of it through, through dashboards but also other integrations. A um, little bit about the company itself, so we have more than 500 integrations. As I said, we, we basically integrate with, with anything in the cloud and that's where I think where we really shine. Um, so it ranges from you know, application servers, SaaS solutions, uh, you name it, we, we can pull data from there, like metrics or logs or other things. Um, currently we're about 3,000, more than 3,000 people uh, with about 1,000 in engineering. Um, and why I put this on is that we sort of to, to, to signify the, the fact that we are a very engineering heavy organization. Um, it's a product for technical people by technical people, um, which, is, which is really, really nice. Um, we have about yeah, 18,500 18, customers and uh, we run on millions of hosts. And that, as I mentioned, it goes from like actual physical hardware, some people use us uh, on premise, to virtual machines and, and containers, et cetera. And most important for this talk at least is multi-cloud. And I was doing a dry run at the office uh, uh, last week, and the person that I sort of was talking to is like, well, what do you mean with multi-cloud? It's like, oh, that's actually a good question. Um, because you can interpret this as we support multiple clouds, which we do, um, and you can interpret this as we, we run ourselves in multiple clouds, um, which we also do. Um, this talks mostly about the latter. So 
it's about how did we build um, stuff and an infrastructure, um, data infrastructure in in multiple clouds so that it's easy uh, to do so. But that said, we um, we we monitor multiple different uh, clouds and predominantly AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform, and uh, Azure. Um, so why multi-cloud for us, right? Like we could ov obviously just, actually Datadog started in AWS, that was still our biggest footprint, but um, like why do we want to want to go multi-cloud? Because you could just stay in AWS and customers send us their data um, and you know, we could analyze it for them, we could expose it. Um, but we want to be close to our customers for multiple different reasons. Like obviously there's a cost involved with, um, like egress and ingress of data. So our customers would pay us, or would pay the cloud providers, would pay network transit, um, et cetera. Um, and so do we for, for ingesting data. So it's nice to be close to each other because moving data within a specific cloud or actually even within like different regions within, uh, within a cloud is much, much, uh, much cheaper. Um, there's some legal constraints here and there. Um, on one hand, some countries don't allow data to be uh, sort of exported to, uh, to different places. GDPR in the EU is a, is a good example. Um, and uh, there's other legislation uh, where you want data to be, be kept. Um, there's like certifications like PCI, uh, FedRAMP, which is a US uh, certification that allows you to work, uh, to provide services for the, for the US government, for example. Um, those are sort of legal obligations and that constrains you to either like a multi-cloud or a particular region in the cloud. Um, and then there's contracts. There are uh, customers that really don't want their uh, data to be in a specific cloud. Um, I can't name any names, but you can think of a big retailer in the US that doesn't want their data to be in a, a cloud that happens to be operated by another retailer, uh, things like that. Um, so yeah, different contracts with, with different, uh, different cloud providers um, makes us want to be in you know, a multitude of cloud providers. So as I mentioned, we are in AWS, GCP, and, and Azure. Um, and it's also nice that these cloud providers often put us in their sort of stores. They have app stores where you can then um, choose like which monitoring solution you want. And, and Datadog is then um, like sort of offered as an, as an offering in these multiple clouds. Um, and secondly, dog fooding is an important aspect for us. Uh, we monitor Datadog using Datadog. So dog fooding is not even a pun, right, for, for us. Um, and being able to, of course, monitor ourselves is important and monitor like specific cloud, uh, cloud like primitives um, is important. So the integrations will only be, be, uh, be better. Now, how do we multi-cloud? Um, so in general, we have sort of a strategy and like how to deal with this because running in multiple clouds at the same time is not easy. Uh, there are very, like even though sort of clouds somewhat look similar, there are different interfaces, different services, they operate in different ways. Um, so what we've chosen to do is to really separate environments uh, per cloud and geographical region. So if you're a customer, say you're a customer in AWS, um, in the US, you're tied to a specific, what we call data center. And the data center is then sort of a cloud and a geographical location together. Um, if you're a customer in the EU and you happen to be on GCP, you're tied to a specific instance of Datadog. And those instances are, um, mostly disconnected. So we don't move much, move much data between them. Um, we do provide, for certain cases, sort of uh, like failover, but that's always within a single cloud. It's very uncommon that a customer wants to be moving data from, um, in, in cases of you know, disaster recovery or something, to move from AWS to Azure, for example. So we, we are lucky in that way that we can, we can separate those environments really nicely. Um, we also have, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have specialized environments for specific, um, specific certifications. So FedRAMP is one where um, we have FedRAMP certification and therefore we build a specialized FedRAMP environment where only the US government can, uh, can, can, can be in. Uh, has very strict security controls. Um, there's a lot of control around deployment of things and change management. Um, PCI is another one, um, HIPAA, the, the US uh, Healthcare Act that has specific uh, legislation around these things. So we build these specific environments. Um, we also try to standardize as much as possible on cloud agnostic technology. Kubernetes is a really good example. Um, when Datadog started, we ran everything on separate VMs and everything was uh, 
uh, you know, we spin up a VM configured with Puppet or Chef, or something like that. Um, but that's obviously different in, in AWS than in GCP than in Azure. Um, so over the last few years, we've actively moved pretty much everything to, uh, to Kubernetes. Um, which allows us sort of a, a baseline. We just create a container, and for an engineer at Datadog, it doesn't really matter where you deploy that; it just runs on Kubernetes, and that's it. So we've, yeah, we've we've created that environment, um, and we, wherever we can, we try to use so non-cloud specific um, specific uh, technology. However, in certain cases, you can't, right? Like the Kubernetes clusters themselves that we build have to run on, you know, say EC2 or on, on Compute Engine uh, in, in, in GCP. Um, but for that, we build um, sort of cloud agnostic abstractions. We try to abstract away uh, technologies. And I'll talk a little bit more how that works in, uh, in the data engineering space. Um, in certain cases, and especially for analytics, we need sort of like global aggregates, right? We need global information. And wherever we can, we try to move as little data as possible. Um, so we kind of, we, we create aggregates in those specific uh, specific clouds and then move them to a central location for you know further, further analysis. Um, it's kind of like what Hadoop used to do back in the day with data locality, but then we do that at a sort of a global scale. So right, let's talk a little bit about data. Um, so before I go into like how this is built, um, I want to talk a bit more about the main engineering or main use cases for for data engineering. Um, so my team is very much internal. We don't deal a lot with customers, um, but there are teams that do, and they build sort of products on top of uh, on top of what what my teams provide. Um, Data uh, uh, use cases for, for our customers, one is called historical metrics. So what happens at Datadog if you send us your metrics? You install a, an agent on your, within your container or in your, in your VM or in your server, and we start sending, it starts sending uh, metrics. It could be CPU usage, memory usage, disk usage. It could, uh, through an integration, talk to your database, figure out like how many queries per second on your MySQL thing, or how many emails per minute uh, on, your, on your postfix, or you name it. Um, it will gather metrics, and it will start sending that to us. And these metrics go through an intake process and go into what we call our live system. And our live system, um, in that live system, we do a bunch of pre-aggregations, we do indexing of, of, of data, and we expose that within a matter of seconds to you as a user. So you get your nice graph, and you can do all sorts of things with that. Um, what you can also do is set um, monitors, as we call them, on those metrics. So like you say, if, if a particular value goes over, um, uh, if a particular metric goes over a particular value, then alert or under or whatever. Um, but um, we need to, uh, th that's often, often not enough. Uh, we, we can calculate windows over, say, five minutes or, or ten minutes or so, where um, that you then attach to, to a monitor uh, because you don't want sort of flapping behavior. If one, one value goes over and one goes under, then you constantly have like alerts going off. So windowing is a really nice, nice way of sort of smoothing out things. Um, now, we want to do that live and in memory most of the time because you know, we get a lot of data and we want to, the data that comes in needs to be like recalculated and, uh, or these windows, for example, have to be recalculated quickly. So that all happens in, in memory. But after about 24 hours, the use case kind of changes because you don't need to calculate uh, often like an average over 24 hours for a monitor to trigger. Um, so data that's older than 24 hours we consider historical and it sounds you know it's kind of a big word historical but even after 24 hours we want to keep the data around because you as a customer should be able to um, to look at that data to you know spot trends and things like that but um, we don't have to act on that data as we do in the first 24 hours um, so what happens apart from the data that comes into our um, uh, our, our live system. It also goes into a bunch of ETL processing where we dedupe, we clean, um, but we also uh, do roll-ups because we do provide, like the, the further you go back in time, the less granular you get uh, most of the time, especially when it comes to metrics. It's often not that interesting to have a specific metric, say, a year ago. Um, so we roll up to um, hours, days, um, and months. 
um, weeks and months, I think. So, um, so, and that all happens on our data engineering platform. So it's a lot of ETL processing. Um, another use case is data science, where we do root cause analysis, we do anomaly detection, and that's all like sort of offline uh, workloads that that we have. Model training is obviously uh, obviously offline. Um, so we process a lot of data for sort of data science-y type features in our, in our product. Um, and then there are a bunch of internal teams that also use, use our platform. So um, we have revenue engineering. Those are the folks that do metering, calculate usage, and eventually bill our customers. And that happens pretty much once a month. So there's no need for, for sort of real-time stuff there. Um, so they can do a lot of uh, ETL processing there. Um, internal analytics, which is part of my org, uh, where we provide, um, yeah, as I mentioned, we provide data and knowledge to the rest of the company, and that's often on a uh, maybe hourly basis and sometimes even like daily basis that people need their data. So it doesn't have to be part of our real uh, real time system. Um, and then security, our internal security teams once in a while want to go into the data and understand like well, how is the security of our own of our own application of our own environment, um, and of course they you know need to do some spelunking. So at a very high level, kind of talked about this. So data comes in through Datadog, uh, Datadog agent that you install on your, uh, on your server, on your container. Um, then we have a bunch of these integrations where you don't or can't install something yourself. Um, we will grab the data for you. So think Lambda functions or cloud functions or something. Uh, you can't really install anything there, so we poll data for you. We have integrations and, and get that data. That basically goes into massive Kafka. It's multiple clusters in this case. Um, and as I mentioned, like from there it goes into live live systems. Um, and we write data to, to cloud storage. Um, also, at the same time, we have Flink um, as an offering internally that people can, uh, can use. Um, I would highly recommend, if you are into Flink, highly recommend um, seeing a talk tomorrow, I think, by Marton, who's, uh, who's talking about the Flink operator. Um, so we use, we use all that stuff, um, but data um, is processed by Flink and then um, eventually used in the, into the Datadog product. Um, we have stuff that goes onto cloud storage, uh, together with data that we get from business systems, business systems like Salesforce, Zendesk, um, Greenhouse, Workday, uh, Marketo, a bunch of other marketing tools. We get data from that and we put it in cloud storage. Um, and then from cloud storage, we process that with Spark, sometimes get written back to cloud storage, sometimes it's directly using the product. Um, and for analytical purposes, this all ends up in Snowflake. There's, there are some cases where we have business systems and we ingest from business systems direct into, directly into Snowflake. So now how is this built? Uh, what are the technologies that we've built and that we use to do this across multiple clouds? Um, so the first thing is Mortar. And Mortar is a, a system that we actually bought a company in 2015 that had a solution for this, um, and we've, we've uh, sort of done away with the company and their customers, but we use this internally. And Mortar is a system that takes care of cluster lifecycle management um, across multiple clouds. So as a data engineer, you can schedule, you have a job, and you can schedule that and tell Mortar, for this job, I need X amount of worker nodes, I need X amount of uh, memory, I need X amount of CPU power. Um, and then Mortar will, when the job needs to run, Mortar will spin up a cluster in the cloud. It will also tear it down or reuse it if it can be reused for other jobs. Um, and uh, does that across multiple clouds. So um, data engineers don't have to do that themselves, have to schedule things in a different way in, in, in Azure versus GCP versus, uh, versus AWS. Um, and um, historically, we, when we started this, uh, we were predominantly in AWS. So we used Elastic MapReduce for this. So Mortar talks to Elastic MapReduce and, 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 and uh, uh, yeah, does the life cycle of, of clusters. Um, we also, I forgot to mention, but what we do is we use ephemeral clusters. So it's pretty much one job, one cluster, rather than using uh, large multi-tenant tenant clusters in the cloud. Uh, Multi-tenancy is just really painful. Um, when I was at Spotify, we had 3,500 node Hadoop cluster on-premise. It was really cool. It's a cool number to say, like, we run, like, a two, three petabyte system with 3,500 nodes, uh, but it's also really, really painful to, to operate. 
I have to do queuing and all that kind of stuff. And if you, in, in this case, we have the ability to spin up small clusters for each job, it makes life a lot, lot easier. Um, and then we tear them down when they're done. So like things that happen over time, cluster degrades. Um, if we run with HDFS, like HDFS is always painful. So um, that sort of goes away because it's just the job runs and we tear it down. If jobs fail, well, we're just going to try again to start up a new cluster. Um, in AWS, we use spot instances, which is the cheaper version of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of you know, run operating. Um, but the, the problem with spot instances is that, that they could, could be killed at any moment. Um, for ETL workloads, that's fine. A couple nodes die. Job might finish, might not, but we restart it. So a lot less uh, management. Um, we, when we moved to, into GCP, um, we integrated with Dataproc, which is a very similar uh, thing as, as Elastic MapReduce. Um, but then when we moved into Azure, we thought like, hmm, do we really want to integrate HD Insights, which is their version, uh, the Microsoft version of EMR slash Dataproc? Um, turned out that startup times were very, uh, very long, and it's like it added yet another layer of complexity to have Mortar talk three clouds now, and who knows in the future there's a fourth one. Um, and most of our most of our jobs are actually run using Spark, so we figured why not? And Spark had just introduced uh, um, the, the Kubernetes support, so rather than running it on a Yarn cluster that you spin up, it runs directly on Kubernetes. Um, so we said, okay, we're going to move everything to to Spark on Kubernetes. So um, within Azure, we've never done HD Insights; we just run straight on on Kubernetes, and we're now actively moving uh, GCP and, and AWS over. Um, Mortar as a, as a platform also um, takes care of scheduling and orchestration. We, um, we use Luigi. I don't know if anybody knows about Luigi. It's an old Spotify project, not used by Spotify anymore. Uh, worked well for a while. Um, I think it has sort of, it's definitely end of life, um, but it's still like there's so much code that runs Luigi uh, or that is instrumented through Luigi. Luigi takes care of dependency management and, 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 and orchestration. Um, we're sort of moving to something else, and I can't talk too much about it. Maybe that's a talk for another day, um, maybe next year where we have some more insights, but we're, we're not moving to Airflow. We're trying something, uh, something else uh, ourselves. Um, but there's a lot of Luigi code, but Mortar and Luigi are very, very integrated, um, which we also should sort of not do. But um, regardless, um, moving to something else there. Um, but it's going to be part of the Mortar platform. Um, then Mortar takes care of uh, continuous integration and continuous deployment. Uh, we have a mono repo where all data engineers put their both Luigi and Spark code in, and once they push upstream, things get built, artifacts get built, those artifacts get distributed to different um, cloud um, uh, storage. Um, so AWS S3, um, GCS, and Azure Blob Store, and from there it can then be run. So for engineers, you don't have to upload your own things, compile stuff, it's just you push, and even if it's not on the main branch, if it's on a feature branch or your own like personal branch, it will be built and you can, you can access that and you can uh, schedule those things in order. And we like to provide sort of a single interface across all these clouds. And that's not just a UI, and I'll have a, a, a screenshot of, the, of that in the next slide, but also um, CLI tools. So if you're an engineer and you have to think about, like, okay, this data center, because our data centers have names like US1, EU1, um, et cetera, EU2, US2, uh, then you have to know EU1 is AWS in the US, um, so I need to, if I want a list of a few files, I need to go S3 LS something. Um, but if I'm an EU one, which happens then to be GCP in Europe, for example, um, I need to then type GSUtil LS. So, you know, and that's, those are small things, but there's like with a large developer um, environment, or like a developer crowd, um, that adds up, right? Cognitive overload or cognitive switching, context switching constantly. So we try to provide tools that sort of take that away and abstract that away. You just, depending on the context that you're in, the system will, will do the right thing. So here's a quick screenshot of uh, Mortar. Um, 
So Mortar uses, uh, in, in Mortar you can look at your jobs. Um, in this case, this is just Luigi jobs, but um, things that's scheduled, you see that there are, some are failed, some are still running, some are incomplete. Um, you, users can, can uh, filter by, by data center up there, so um, different. And they, here they do see which, which cloud is which technology and which regions, et cetera. Um, and then they can do all sorts of cool management stuff. Um, Little note on this, um, Datadog has its own React library called Druids um, and has a bunch of components. We, that's unfortunately not open source. However, um, last week I think there was a really interesting blog post if you're into sort of front-end engineering and, and those kind of things. An interesting blog post and a site that we've, that we've uh, built around sort of design principles for, for user interfaces. Um, and we, within my teams, even though we're an internal team, we still want to look and feel to be like Datadog because our engineers use Daydog on a da daily basis. So it's, it's similar-ish. The other big thing, or another big thing, within sort of our multi-cloud strategy is Census. Um, census is a data management and governance system, um, or you could call it a meta store, metadata store, where um, we try to capture all the metadata to understand lineage, things like personal identifiable information, quality metrics of data. Um, when I was at Spotify back in the day, we had, as I mentioned, this 3,500 node Hadoop cluster. Um, this was started as a Hadoop 1 and then moved to Hadoop 2 and Yarn. Um, but security at the time was not, was not great. We didn't really care, actually. So they had this sort of big data lake where everybody just threw data in um, and anybody could access it. Um, the problem there was not only just security, but it was also that nobody knew who had produced what. It, when you work with data, there's always an I.O. boundary. Like you, as a producer, write some data, and somebody else might consume that. You don't know who, but you don't know who. You can um, look at audit logs sometimes, but even then, you might know maybe who or what service account or like what sort of user accessed your data, but you still don't know which piece of code did access that. So, um, and that's sometimes problematic, or that becomes problematic the more data you have. Um, at Spotify, this was definitely a problem. We had use cases where, or cases where fraud had to be uh, analyzed, and it took an analyst m weeks to figure out like what were all the data sets that were affected and tainted, and then have to clean all that up. Um, when I joined Datadog three and a half years ago, we were at this nice point where we, teams still kind of knew who would consume their data downstream, um, but it started to be painful. And there was a moment where we said, okay, we are going to make an investment in metadata management and particularly in lineage, um, so we understand like how data flows. Um, for me, it's pretty scary not knowing exactly where personal, uh, personal identifiable information is, especially with GDPR, uh, there's the right to be forgotten, so we need to be able to delete uh, data from in our case, not our customers, but our customers' customers' data. If, if, like, and the interesting thing at, at Datadog is that we don't own the data. Like, it's not our data. It's our customers' data. And if our customers decide to put PII in, say, log files or even metric names or context to, um, to, to send to us, like, we don't have any sort of control over that. So there's a bunch of data that we need to, like, mark as potential PII. And we need to be able to track that. Um, same with like data ending up on a profit and loss statement, like P&L. Um, I want to know where that comes from and I know where it ends up. And if something's wrong, we need to be able to clean that up. So we started investing in, uh, in this. Um, there are a bunch of, bunch of uh, systems out there, um, but we decided, like, for us, it's, it's, it works better if we, we build this ourselves. Um, so. Um, census is, is the thing, and it's a canonical source for metadata. And not only within data engineering, um, sort of part of the world, offline world, but we start to add more and more data sources that, um, that are in our live system, like indices, like Elasticsearch, or uh, Kafka topics, dashboards, um, you name it, we, we want it all uh, in, in that system because we understand where data goes. Um, and we've, we've integrated this with Luigi, obviously. This was sort of the first use case. So um, automatically, if you write a data pipeline in Spark and instrument that with Luigi, we put metadata into Census, and Census can then figure out lineage. Um, and users can now start using Census as a source of truth. Is data there or not? Um, one, of, one, problems that we, one of the problems that we had was that there were lots of queries or lots of requests to cloud storage, like, sorry, stat and, and um, 
list requests, for example, uh, with like tons of small files, and that would take forever to figure out is the data there. Um, if you, even if you compare things like um, HDFS, which has a sort of a file allocation table where the name node gives you a list of files, you don't have to go through each of the nodes. Uh, with cloud storage, it's often different. Like you, you like recursing uh, paths is pretty tedious. So you have to recurse like every pa every path kind of manually, or client on the client side, I must say. So with with meta uh, with uh, sorry with census, we can just query. It's an actual like database. Uh, it's powered by Postgres in this case, and we can just query query if data is there. We can also do more than just the existence of data. We can say, oh, is this data available? But also, we happen to have collected a bunch of quality metrics, amount of rows, data size. Um, is a particular column, um, does it contain nulls? Uh, does it adhere to some enum? Um, a whole bunch of like, yeah, we can we let your, can let your, your imagination run wild there. Um, but it allows us to use that to inform like, should this job actually run or not? Not just data exists, but also like there's more there. Um, and how does this help in a multi-cloud environment is because you know there's now multiple environments that are fairly large and what data is what what are we talking about is it data from azure is it data from from aws so census is a big sort of uh, help in in that way that we can you know, manage the data better um and on the analytics side we uh, we started investing a lot in snowflake um so we positioned this internally as the canonical data warehouse for for analytics and um, Snowflake is multi-cloud, so therefore we can use this in a multi-cloud environment. Um, we used to be, uh, we used to use Redshift, um, which is fine. Like as I mentioned earlier, there's a bunch of aggregations that we do in specific clouds, and then move it into the central location. Um, however, there is data that just can never ever leave um, uh, the region. Like as, again, GDPR, for example, data cannot be you, uh, about uh, data about uh, EU persons cannot be stored in the US, for example. So there is always going to be like a bit of data that we just can't either aggregate, we have to work with directly. Um, so we have these multi-regions, uh, Snowflake multi-regions for us what we call region-restricted data. And that then powers Metabase, which is our, um, our, uh, our BI tool. Um, and that we do run in a, in a central location. So Metabase connects to multiple, uh, multiple um, Snowflake instances. Um, now, having built this sort of infrastructure, uh, one of the things that we, we see and that becomes, it's not so much has to do with like multi-cloud, but sort of give you a little bit of peek what's going on, at least at Datadog, is we see there's a lot of movement from um, extract, transform, load to extract, load, transform, um, where currently and historically, we had many sort of bespoke Spark pipelines, and we ingest data and then aggregate it. We extract it actually from different business systems or from our own product, um, do something with it, and then shove it into a database. We move now. We move more raw data into a data warehouse because uh, if you look at performance for for from, for example, Snowflake and Redshift, um, Snowflake is just way more powerful. Um, Similar thing, if you were only operating in, say, GCP, you could do so shove it into BigQuery. Um, I'm a big fan of BigQuery myself, um, but again, we like Datadog. We can't use it because it's only available in uh, um, in, in uh, GCP. Uh, but what we see is like there's a lot of a lot of data that we just move straight into Snowflake, and then we uh, we we basically run queries on top of that, and a lot of the computation happens at query time because it's fast enough to power dashboards. Um, in the cases where we still where still there's a slowdown, rather than a team having to write bespoke Spark pipelines, we uh, pre-aggregate things using DBT, so they can. Uh, DBT's system where you use SQL to build pipelines um, and for you know simple to sort of medium um, uh, uh, difficulty pipelines you could do that in DBT and it's also that analysts can do this themselves in many cases so you don't have to have a data engineer that's first in Spark for example to to do that um, and in our case actually our Spark Spark pipelines are all in Scala so that's like another another um, step. Uh, for 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 analysts to to take, um, so we we tend to give them DBT to do those things. Um, where we had a lot of bespoke connectors built ourselves to integrate with 
Salesforce and Greenhouse and Zendesk, uh, we're now starting to move to Airbyte. Uh, which, so the idea is to create this self-serve environment uh, for, for analysts rather than us having to, to implement all these things. So a few lessons learned before um, I end. Um, Multi-cloud is, is easier if you don't have to connect clouds. Like coming back to what I mentioned in the first place, um, if you want as a company to move into the cloud and you ha want to have a multi-cloud strategy for whatever reason, right? Like cost or legal reasons, or you don't want a vendor lock-in, that's another one. Um, then, and if you can get away with it, um, having multiple instances in different places is really, really, really nice. Um, obviously, you can't always do that. It really depends on your use case. Um, but yeah, it takes a lot of, uh, engineering effort and infrastructure to have you know multiple clouds talk to each other. Um, as I mentioned, abstractions, abstractions, abstractions. It's really important to build things that abstract away um, stuff, and especially if you have a growing engineering organization, um, you don't want to teach people the same thing th uh, three times or four times or whatever. And for us, as I said, cloud agnostic technology is what makes this work. So really standardizing, and we can't always do this, right? But wherever we can, we try to use cloud agnostic, uh, agnostic tools. Um, even with Kubernetes, we run our own Kubernetes clusters on top of EC2, on top of Compute Engine, um, rather than relying on um, container engines that are provided by, um, by cloud providers. Um, so that's, that's it, and I think we can go to questions. Um, I think Alex is Alex was supposed to moderate this, I think. Yeah, there he is. All right, so we have a few questions for you Sweet. on Slido. And the first one is, could you share more detail on your Kafka deployment? Um, yeah, it depends on what detail. Uh, it's big. It's a lot. Uh, so we, we operate, it, like, I don't know exactly what this, what this question means, but we operate multiple, multiple um, large Kafka, Kafka deployments. Um, and Kafka is sort of really the, yeah, it really provides the backbone for, for, um, uh, for Datadog. We build, like, metrics and logs, and every, everything ends up in Kafka to begin with, and then we build applications on top of that. Um, okay, so I guess if they want more information, whoever asked that question yeah, should... Yeah, come and see me, should, absolutely. Or add another question yep. onto Slido, yeah. Our next question, what are the main differences between Spark and Flink as ETL engines? It's a really good question. So when we use, uh, we use Spark mostly in um, sort of batch mode. We don't do a lot of Spark streaming. Um, Flink is really for sort of event processing, things that have sort of lower latency, like requirements and need to be like directly visible, say in the, in the, in the, in, in, in our product or in other, you know, places of the organization. Um, so we did an investigation or a comparison between Flink and Spark streaming. Um, eventually went for Flink because um, Flink just offered a bunch of requirements, a bunch of features, and I don't know exactly which ones, but uh, a bunch of features that, that our internal users wanted. Um, so we went, we went for Flink. Um, so Spark is really for ETLs, like batch, um, you know, runs on a say hourly basis or daily basis, and Flink is really like sub, I wouldn't say sub-second, but you know, within a few seconds from, from start to finish. Awesome. How do you track the costs in a multi-cloud environment? Um, so I don't know if I can, I I'm, I'm probably might be able to say this, but we're going to be launching a cloud cost product uh, in, uh, in our own conference uh, next month. Um, so we use that internally to, uh, to monitor cost. And we have all these integrations. So part of our integration is also cost. And we, we pull that in from clouds and then uh, analyze that. So historically, that was uh, through our analytics team. And now we're, we're sort of opening that up to the world. So you, ha you haven't done that yet. Uh, you, so you're announcing it here first. I guess. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. More more information to come on that next week. Do you have a cloud provider preference? Personally, yes. <laughs> Are you allowed to share? <laughs> yeah, that's my personal opinion. Like uh, for Datadog, we don't care, right? Like we we operate and we work well. We work together with with uh, with different clouds, and they're all very good to us as well. Um, I personally like Google Cloud Platform, but I'm a data nerd, so um, I personally think that, that, that um, Google's done probably the best in data technology. Things like BigQuery is super transformative or was super transformative for a while. Um, 
I kind of like data flow, um, sort of beam stuff. Um, yeah, I think like when it, and when we, when I was at Spotify, we moved from on-premise to, to uh, Google. And one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons that, that we chose Google's cloud platform was because Google's just really strong in data. Um, yeah, so that, that's the main reason that I personally like it. All right, great. Oops. Why Airflow? Why isn't Airflow an option for you instead of Luigi? I knew that was just coming. Um, because Airflow is just a better Luigi. Um, but it's still a Luigi. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems that I have, and I'm, I'm not too versed, to be honest. I like, was part of the team writing Luigi. Um, I'm not too versed in Airflow. But um, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, Lots. <laughs> OK. So um, I personally, this is a, my personal opinion. Um, personally, I, um, I think the domain of scheduling and orchestration is finite. Um, and what we did with Luigi is basically throw a Turing complete programming language at it. Luigi itself is fairly slim in terms of framework. It doesn't give you a lot of abstractions. Um, but you, as a, as a data engineer, have the power to do everything. Which you know, it's nice if you're an engineer, but it gets messy real quick. So, um, especially at Datadog, what we've seen is that because Luigi doesn't provide any um, abstractions uh, or strong abstractions, teams have done one of two things. Like one is they've built abstractions themselves. Um, we have a team that built abstraction on top of abstraction on top of abstraction, and eventually they have a class that they can inherit and override a single method that returns a string, and ta-da, you have a new data set, which is awesome if you write 5,000 data sets a day, which nobody does. Um, it's not so awesome if you woke up, wake up in the middle of the night on call and you have to figure out what the hell is wrong. Um, so that's, that's a problem. The other side is that because there are no abstractions, um, uh, people have sort of coded their way out of it. Um, and there's, like, we have Luigi jobs that are 500 to 1,000 lines of code to what I think should be, like, the use cases for scheduling and orchestration you can probably count on one, maybe two hands. Um, infill, backfill, test run, rerun, maybe some late data uh, ingestion. There isn't that much, much, like, obviously each use case is a little different, but I don't think the use cases are that snowflakey. So um, given that I think that there is a, um, the domain of scheduling and orchestration is finite, um, it's kind of weird to throw like a, a full programming language at it. So what we're exploring right now is can we come up with a DSL, uh, so the domain specific language that expresses intent from a user. And that's where Airflow, I think, also falls short. Like in Airflow, you still, it's still Python, you still code your way out of scheduling and orchestration. Because um, what I want is people in the middle of the night looking at somebody else's job go like, oh, I understand what this means, I understand what this does, I understand what the inputs are, I understand what the outputs are, um, a bit of weird like windowing logic and things like that. But um, it doesn't obviously say anything about the actual processing, but the scheduling part should be, should be clear. So um, that's why we're trying something else. And given that we have so much Luigi code, um, having a, a lift to Airflow would just not be like that much more valuable than what we can provide uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with Luigi. Um, last thing I'm going to say about this is kind of quoting Linus Torvalds, uh, or paraphrasing rather. Um, the Linux, Linux community was, was looking at a new, they were on um, CVS concurrent versioning system as their versioning system back in the day, and started having problems because CVS is, is, like, was the first real versioning system, but it wasn't that great. Um, and a lot of people said, like, well, subversion is the thing. Like, everybody's not using subversion, um, so we should move to subversion. And Linus wrote back, like, well, subversion is still a CVS. It's, it's still based on the same principles and the same paradigms, and we're not going to do that because the lift is way too much. Uh, and what ended up happening is that Linus himself wrote Git, and Git is now the most used thing. So it's kind of a bet that, that I'm willing to take, saying, like, we can actually come up with something better. Rant awesome. over. <laughs> awesome. Our next question. What solution do you use for infrastructure management? And do you use Terraform? Yes. So we're a really big, big user of Terraform. Like everything is Terraformed, um, which is like sometimes YAML hell. But uh, yeah, that's, that's where, where pretty much everything, uh, everything happens. Um, coming back to the scheduling thing um, is that we, in that, in that particular project, we're also looking to um, sort of abstract away a bunch of the Terraform stuff uh, because it can be tedious. Um, there's tons of yeah, YAML that you have to sort of sift through to make things work. Um, and 
I, th I think it would be really nice if, if you as a, as a user can say this is, I, I, uh, I define what my scheduling is going to look like, what my inputs are, what my outputs are, that the outputs then are, are directly um, buckets, for example, are ge generated by, uh, by Terraform. But yes, Terraform is all over the place. Uh -huh. Great. Lots more questions, and please keep the questions coming. You moved computation at query time. How much did it impact average query duration, and do you have any stats? I don't, I do have stats, but I can't share those. Um, but uh, obviously it, it, it did, uh, it does impact query time, but it really depends on like to what extent you can, we used to, to aggregate. Like, um, especially with, like for dashboarding, it's one thing, a reporting, you know, beforehand kind of what data you want to dashboard. So you can pre-aggregate that as well. And then we do this, we still do this with, like as I mentioned with DBT. Um, however, for sort of ad hoc analysis and exploration, uh, that's much harder to predict. You'll still end up with, with queries. Um, yeah, Redshift wasn't that great in sort of that, that type of workload. So we, we have, on one hand, sort of average query time might have, might have gone up a little bit, but not to an extent where, uh, where things get annoying. And if they get annoying for users, we sort of um, pre-calculate views or uh, um, pre-calculate tables using dbt. Um, or, um, uh, yeah, if it gets annoying, we do that. And otherwise, it, we're, we're fine. So yeah, I don't have any stats that I could share, unfortunately. OK. Uh, why Snowflake and not Databricks Delta for analytics? Snowflakes is costlier than Databricks. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I, I wasn't part of the of sort of the negotiations there and the um, the, the the evaluation. Um, yes, I can't really say. <laughs> to be honest, uh, um, we did we did an extensive extensive uh, comparison between things. Cost is one thing, but also like relationship with with vendor, uh, like um, their multi cloud strategy, uh, things like that are are, are important. Um, yeah, this was just before I took over the analytics team, so they had sort of decided on Snowflake when I, when I, when they joined my my organization. But um, yeah, it's a good question. Like, I sorry, I don't have the answer. There's lots of factors, more than just cost. Yeah, more than just cost, for sure. Yeah, like, there's yeah. performance. There is like a vendor relationship is important. Uh, yeah, as I said, multi-cloud strategy is important for us. Um, direction of the company, things like that. But I can't really tell you which 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 sort of weighed how they weighed and how we we made that hmm. decision. I think that's a good answer. Why did you choose Airbyte instead of other solutions like Fivetran? So Airbyte uh, provides at least the connectors that we, we want. Um, I personally don't know too much about Fivetran, but we, uh, again, we have a good relationship with Airbyte. Um, it's open source, which for us is important. Like we tend to stay away from uh, SaaS solutions, and I don't know if Fivetran is just like purely a SaaS solution, but um, for us it was, it just tried it out, works well. Um, this seems seems cool. Uh, we can help out with building connectors and, and contributing that back to the open source community, um, and it just works. Uh, so yeah. All right. A lot of why this and not that questions coming up here. Yeah. Um, how about do you support the mainland China region on AWS as well as the FedRAMP compatible U.S. government partition? It has similar legal concerns. What do you make of that question? So we don't, we're not in China as far as I know. Uh, this China is, is, is not an easy market to, to go into. Um, Datadog is a very opportunistic, I would say, company in a way that we, we really want to solve problems and, and go there rather than um, you know, try to do it all. Um, so mainland China hasn't been, as far as I understand, uh, sort of a concern for us. Uh, we do have a FedRAM, we, we just got FedRAMP compliance certification, um, so we do have a, a FedRAMP compatible uh, uh, partition, uh, government partition that we use. Um, yeah, I don't know exactly what the, the legal concerns here are, but uh, from, from for us, there are very much more strict legal restrictions. Um, mm -hmm. for, Gov, for FedRAM, for example, it's only U.S. persons, which is either uh, U.S. citizens or green card holders, or um, there's a, a, another status that is sort of qualified for FedRAMP, um, can only work on FedRAMP and can only access systems and data in FedRAMP. Um, and uh, they have to be on U.S. soil as well, so you can't be abroad and doing things. So we have, yeah, that's it's been a really interesting, interesting project to organize not just the access 
um, but also like how do you deal with on-call rotations because we have a large part of our developer um, community within Datadog is in New York or in the US, uh, but it, like another big part is in, in Europe. So Paris is a big hub for us and um, we have people all over the place so we had to you know, combine, try to combine uh, on-call rotations for example. Um, and then FedRAMP has an additional concern that there has to be you, a person actually has to be, has to push the button to deploy um, software. So um, yeah, it's been an interesting challenge, but we made it work. So I bet it's different in the U.S. and in Europe, and it's all yeah 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 yeah. It's it's pretty it's pretty strict. Like the things that you and also the fines are pretty high, so you don't want to mess it up. <laughs> yeah. How much? <laughs> I don't know. A lot. Can't a lot. can't share. <laughs> um, what is the alternative? You're experimenting with instead of Airflow. Yes, yeah, so it's going to be an internal an internal system. Um, the fact that we have Sense has actually made a lot of um, made a lot of difference for us because um, I was working with a colleague of mine a couple of years ago. Uh, we had this idea of Census and like, let, what wouldn't it be nice if we have all this metadata? And then we started sort of ideating and like, if we have all this metadata in a in a in a, in a central store, then we can act on that metadata as well. And that's kind of what what this new system is going to be doing. So rather than um, like Luigi and Airflow, Airflow sensor. I know somebody's going to say Airflow sensors can do this, uh, but it's kind of bolted on to to Airflow. Um, but what we want is to act on so the state of the world. Call it an event um, that we could we can then act on and census provides this because something is written to to census and we know okay we have the data exists and it has these and these and these quality properties um, now we can run we can start running a job so we get more event-based uh, job scheduling or job triggering rather um, and um, then the actual next step would be to then optimize the schedule so we can run things doesn't mean if you can run something doesn't mean you should run it. Um, so we will add that at some point probably. But yeah, it's going to be an internal internal system. The code name is TAP right now for Task Automation pro pro Process Product Platform something. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, not even quite an imaginative name. So uh, it's T A P P P P. Maybe yes. yeah. Oh, that's a good one. I mean, I should I should uh, now it's T A P. But I, I'll I'll talk to the team. That add a few more P's. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> We have a couple more questions, sure. and would you like to choose, Walter, from the questions here? Because I, I don't think we can get to all of them, but um, which ones are the most interesting for you? Um, Pick one. Let, let's go for the, the one about census and then maybe the last one about like Python and Scala and Java. Okay, um, so what's the reason for using census for data governance instead of other available solutions? Um, I think like it, it's always hard when you it's an emerging space um, like data management and governance is is I feel like if you look at big data over the last decade and decade and a half or so it started all with like MapReduce in like the mid mid 2000 and Hadoop as an open source solution and as mankind we tried to sort of figure out how this works and um, and then you have things like Spark and Apache Beam and then like things like Flink and Spark streaming started with Storm um, and we're, we're still trying to find fig, figure things out. And some things become sort of de facto standards, like I think Spark is, is very predominant in the industry. Um, the cloud platforms start to start becoming way more, way more ubiquitous. Um, and I feel like, like at least when we started Census, which about two years ago, um, there were a bunch of different options that we could have gone for uh, when it comes to governance. Um, we did an evaluation at the time. There's uh, Merquez by Datakin, um, Coming out of WeWork, um, Adminson, uh, there's a bunch of bunch of Apache projects nowadays that that do that, um, but yeah, they didn't really fit our way of like our workflows and our way of working. Um, one, and this is more of a hypothesis that I have personally, is that if you if you look at companies growing over time, uh, complexity obviously increases. Like the stuff that you've built, um, there's legacy, there's new things, but the complexity of your environment increases and. Um, you see companies growing uh, that are growing and uh, certain, at, at certain certain size. Um, less, it's less interesting to take something off the shelf, so um, either buy or or take some open source and then sort of uh, um, adjust it to your to your environment. Um, then rather than building something yourself, you see Google and Facebook, for example. And obviously they are way bigger than we are, uh, but they they tend to not take a lot of things off the shelf and and work with that um, because the cost of adapting something is is much higher than than maybe or just as high as building it yourself. Right. Um, 
Luigi, I think for us is a good example where we actually running still with an old fork of Luigi, uh, which is like, super painful um, because yeah, there was there was a time where it, Luigi had didn't have an event system, and um, we built that ourselves. And then like once we wanted to push that upstream like a day before somebody else had pushed the PR to make an ev another event system, so we're we're stuck with an old fork uh, of Luigi, and we sort of backport some stuff. It just gets really really painful if you have to diverge. Um, Obviously, you know, like open source is awesome and you get a lot of, you know, help from, from other developers. But in this case, census, it was too early for sort of to figure out like where is the market going? What's the predominant uh, solution? All right. Awesome. Where are we going next, Walter? We could do the top one. Okay. What's your Spark programming language? Python, Scala, Java, or something else? Uh, it's Scala mostly, yeah. Um, it's actually all Scala. We try to discourage people from using Python. Um, Except for when it's sort of um, Spark SQL that engineer or like data scientists and, and, and analysts can use, but our production uh, code we want to be done in Scala because you know you have the uh, the, the benefit of a compiler that tells you if it's going to work or not, like partially before you put it in production. Um, Python is uh, is just hard; it breaks at runtime sometimes, and that yeah, it's like hard thing. Um, we do. Um, provide a notebook solution for, for people, a uh, Jupyter notebook solution where they can either choose Python or Scala. Uh, but you still see people, yeah, there you see people doing like Spark SQL in, sometimes in Python, sometimes in, in Scala because it's, you know, the amount of code that you need is not that high. Um, so yeah, it's mostly, mostly Scala. Uh, okay. Awesome. Two more. Where, where would you like to go next? Uh, let's see. Um, I'll skip the, the the one about Kubernetes because I just don't know exactly why why we do, like why we don't. I, yeah, I'm not. I, this was sort of before my time that we moved to Kubernetes, so I don't know much about the decisions why we're use, building our own clusters. Okay. Um, we could talk a bit about Spark on Kubernetes. Um, and is that our third? The one last, now? the the fourth one. Does Spark work well now on Kubernetes? Did yeah. You have, do you have any issues? Yeah, so it does. Uh, well, it work, works works well for us. Um, uh, obviously, it's somewhat new within the Spark code base. It was introduced in Spark three, and we're now at three one or three two or so. Um, it works well. The only thing that's harder is HDFS. Uh, so in sort of standard Spark or Spark on Yarn, you can run Spark with HDFS or without. And HDFS is the Hadoop distributed file system, where it allows you to, um, you know, like uh, have data and then store it in HDFS and then run another job on that same HDFS. Um, with Kubernetes, you don't get a file system, so you have to resort to something else. So we had to make a bunch of modifications. And there weren't that many many jobs, many pipelines that actually used HDFS, but we had to move uh, a, bunch of, a bunch of jobs that really relied on HDFS and work with teams to you know, change their way of working and write stuff to, to blob storage instead. Um, but it was, it was a small, small um, amount. And once we ironed that out, um, actually went pretty, pretty quick. Um, one hard thing to do, I think, in infrastructure in general is if you come up with something new, and you want teams to migrate to that new thing, um, like how are you going to do that, right? Like so, uh, for us, it's sometimes uh, challenging to, to yeah, tell a team like go and move while that's not their mission. Right? Like a team like Historical Metrics, for example, their mission is to build historical metrics for our customers and to make sure that that works. And then we go like, hey, you, do you, you need to move to Spark and Kubernetes, or you need to move to, from Luigi to this new thing, or move to Census. And um, so we're trying to find like that's where, where more of the the challenge lies is like how do you how do you get teams to move to new technology and adopt that while while we as an infrastructure team see the value across the board like for datadog this is a good thing to do because it cuts costs or it you know it better developer experience but for a team local local uh, locally teams might think like well there's nothing really in, in it for me so why do i do that so mm. yeah that that's that's the bigger bigger challenge wow interesting we have a couple of minutes would you like to pick one last question Walter? let's see um Let's talk, take the first one. Okay. You're using multiple tools, solutions. How do you recruit and train? Um, 
I, one of the things that I was really impressed with when I joined Datadog was sort of the onboarding, uh, the, the sort of due diligence or like the, the structure of onboarding. Um, so we have, we do company onboarding um, really well and that's sort of driven by like HR and by, by, by a bunch of sort of tech evangelists. Um, and then each team also has a very thorough uh, onboarding, uh, onboarding process um, and because it's very local to the team. And through that, we train people in, in, multiple, uh, in multiple like tools and solutions. Um, and where we, I think, uh, New new people joining Datadog are really good, so at least litmus test for like are we doing the right thing when it comes to these abstractions, for example. Um, so I was thinking like we're we've grown so much and we're still growing. Having an understand like having the understanding that there's probably more Datadoggers that are going to be there that are not a Datadog yet, but that we still will hire uh, than they're already there is a good sort of indicator that we need to need to be better and faster and like have more abstractions and make it easier for people to onboard and then thus do their job well. So uh, there's a lot of a lot of focus on uh, on, on on training uh, when it comes to recruitment. Um, we tend to recruit for sort of potential, um, especially I think in the big data space, like technology has moved so fast. Like at some point, um, can't even remember, it was a closure framework that was all the rage. Uh, like you should do data processing closure. Like great, nice, but yeah, nobody uses this anymore. Um, so um, I think it's really, uh, like if, if you understand the concepts of say MapReduce, you, then you can use Spark and um, it's gonna be easier for you because you don't have to implement your own mapper and reducer anymore. But um, so that's what we hire for, like people with experience in concepts and, and potential rather than, oh, you're an expert. And, and we do sometimes, right? Like we need some Scala experts, but um, if you're a data engineer, you've worked with PySpark, and you want to, you know, you're cool with, with, with doing uh, Scala or you've done um, uh, cascading or, uh, uh, or Shio or whatever, then uh, scalding, great. Uh, like, so that we're not recruiting for, for very specific technology. If you sort of get a gist of it, then, right. then you're good. Yeah. Great. Round of applause, please, for Walter to be. Thank you all so much for having me.